by Rama. And you look at that life of discipline. At the age of 16, you just read his uh, uh, dialogue with Vasishta. Yeah? Uh, and his description of marriage. And beautiful Sita's body deconstructed into what it is really made of. The five elements. And whether it is wise to, for him, for Rama to get into marriage. Whether it is good to enter the Sashrama. Or he should, like Shankara later, go straight into uh, sannyasa. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the level of... Uh, and uh, his response to public uh, opinion, comments, uh, great forbearance, giving Ravana a chance, even on 17th day, uh, to return Sita and be saved. He need not be killed on the 18th day. <coughs> These visuals are just a brief relief from a purely, uh, otherwise it look like a technical uh, presentation. <coughs> okay, I mean, this, uh, just uh, even a look at these names, we cannot discuss them in detail, we don't need to discuss. Uh, we, when we talk about Ishta Devata, <coughs> we can uh, at one other level talk about Ishta Rama. Each one of you may have a particular Ishta Rama here. My mother, for example, <coughs> was reading his Sundara Kanda when she got the news that my wife is expecting twin children. Her prayer was that there should be one boy and one girl, which came true. And she said that if the boy is, if the boy is born, he should be named Sundara Rama. And if a girl also is born, she should be made Lalita for Lalita Sasarnamo. These were the two things that she was doing daily Parayana. And that, like that, every family has its own. Uh, Jai Raman here, sitting here, Jai Rama, Victory everywhere, uh, Anantarama. So we, we got all these. Those of you who read Raghuvamsha, that uh, Kalidasa always referred to Ayodhya, not as Ayodhya, but Saketa. <coughs> now, uh, around 1960-70 onwards, I remember the college culture, business culture was make fun of Ekapatni Vradham. The idea of having affairs, dalliance, and so on uh, was e unrealistically popularized. Now, even now, our television serials and papers. Now, I keep telling every audience, especially youth audience that I made, that you may find it all titillating, interesting. It is fun till it happens to you. If your wife or husband strays, you will feel intense pain, anguish, breakup. It will reduce your lifespan. It will cost you various kinds of illnesses. So let us not glor glorify some unrealistic... And in the long run, the only sustainable family organization is uh, Grihasashrama, uh, Egapatni Vada. And one of the partners will die first, not in our hands. Whoever survives must continue in that until the children are very well settled and he is going to go, uh, ready to go uh, into some kind of an old age home, which is our current Vanaprastha. Uh, my cousin's son uh, got married in Bangalore uh, two days ago. So December 2nd was the Muhurtam. Uh, his uh, bride, who is coming into the family, is related to former election commissioner T. N. Station. And uh, many of us have had the pressure of knowing him. When I was chairman of the Shringer Institute of Management, we invited him to inaugurate several of our new batches and conferences. Uh, he established Dharma in the uh, electoral arena and many very, very competent uh, successors like uh, Mr. T.S. Krishnamurti here have carried on and strengthened it further. That is the reason why uh, the election commission is sought after for help. Our former chairman or invited as speakers abroad. Uh, but his wife died a few years ago, as many of you know. And he himself then went into a senior citizen's home. And very sadly, he died a few weeks before the marriage. Uh, we were hoping to see him or at least uh, have his blessings at the wedding. But that life, long life, is one illustration that you can do much good in the world, and many of us do in India. This institution has been strong, but I think currently the divorce rates here are rising exactly when they are falling in the U.S. So people have to lose and rediscover some of these values. <clears throat> <clears throat> so let me uh, uh, finish with my action plan at 7. That gives us half hour for your questions and discussion. We started a little bit late. Uh, 
So, I am taking the liberty, the impertinence of suggesting that each one of us, you, each one of you should have uh, your own personal action plan. Very simple uh, uh, acronym there, Ramarajya, Mission, Vision and Values. How to spread it, popularize it. Uh, we let it be in the consciousness of people. It is like a seed, it will grow. It will not grow in every heart. If it grows in 50% of the hearts, enough. Uh, in some it will grow early, some it will grow late. But keep dropping this, highlighting these values. Even if you are initially met with skepticism, doubt, opposition, even scorn. Uh, <clears throat> share it with your stakeholders. Each one of us has a group of friends, uh, neighbors, uh, relatives. Uh, either maybe if you are senior, you are shishyas. Uh, and if there are more senior people, your gurus, mentors, let's share this with all stakeholders. Also keep learning from them in terms of which value is more important, what could be some difficulties uh, in practicing it. Then we have to get on. Not too much debate, not too much of analysis. Get on with implementation, uh, which will not be perfect in the first round. Keep monitoring and succeeding. And I think it is a process. Ramarajya is not a destination. It's a process. It's a journey. It's a noble journey of continuing this for individuals, families, governments, organizations. So let me uh, complete this and leave it open for your comments, questions, doubt, disagreement, dismissal, whatever you are in English. Can maybe have a chair here. Yeah. <laughs> I will speak from here. Uh, extra mic, eh? you have an extra hand mic? Yeah, I have an extra hand mic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So if anyone has any doubt that Rama is a fiction, he didn't live in this country, uh, they can... <laughs> Some of the uh, secular critics may say that this is a fiction imagination put up by. I'll take uh, questions for five minutes, then we'll go to the panel. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please, yeah. <coughs> I think you, uh, uh, even if it was a fiction, I think it's uh, worth uh, pursuing and. Uh, Huh. It'll settle down. Yes. Such a powerful concept that is worth pursuing. I don't think, at least in my mind, I don't have any doubt very, about very it. Good. Very good. That's a very positive uh, comment. Uh, that, that's what the philosopher Voltaire said. If God did not exist, we will have to invent him. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but the question comes, I think, more from the implementation challenge, as yeah. you yourself have outlined. Yeah. You yeah. started yeah. beautifully with uh, the change or the initiative has to begin with the individual as a unit and then family and then school. Mm. and the community as a whole. <laughs> but today, uh, we are living in a globalized uh, in a environment. As you rightly said, Netflix is already in our uh, homes. Um, uh, the technology, uh, economy, everything has glo shrunk the global uh, you know, uh, ge geography into one, you know, one big yeah, yeah. unit as sure. Earth. So even if India were to pursue, let's say, Ram Rajya or only Tamil Nadu or you know our own home, our own street, the challenges become even more difficult in the current uh, context. So how does one kind of you know uh, uh, keep fighting these uh, yeah. influences and keep them at bay to pursue this? Right, right. Okay, Th that needs uh, strong conviction. Imagine Mahatma Gandhi's life. A lawyer qualified in uh, London went to South Africa to fight cases for a client. <coughs> Who would have thought of non-violence as a way of uh, fighting with a powerful imperialist government, global government? He, he said it is an experiment. I believe in this, Satya Agraha. 
uh, with non-violent uh, ahimsa. <clears throat> and uh, it gradually grew, the conviction in him and others. And by the time he died and a few years later, it was a global influence, exactly the opposite of your fear. Gandhi began in South Africa, brought it to India. And the rainbow revolution in South Africa, in fact, we don't appreciate it enough. It is one of the most magical developments in human history that a white racist regime with apartheid got independence without a massacre of the whites by the blacks. No revenge. Huh? As a unified, as a fantastic Gandhi. The uh, civil rights, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1961. It didn't become a reality even in 2060, uh, 1960, he, he did it in 1861. It didn't become a reality in 1961. Who made it a reality? Martin Luther King, another disciple of Gandhi. Many countries have a local Gandhi. So there is a great man called Lankas Gandhi. There is a Vietnamese Gandhi. And now in the climate change movement, the most quoted thinker, of the 20th century, for the 21st century, is Gandhi. Because his thoughts are so relevant. So I think uh, this spiritual revolution can begin in one small place. Adi Shankara, within the age of 32, by foot going all over. These four months when he set up must have been a hut somewhere, one uh, Sishya. And what they have grown into, they have become, each one of them is a big spiritual samrajyam with millions of people. They're growing stronger every year institutions under them. So I think if we begin in India, we are the legitimate inheritors. It is our dharma, our duty. We will be failing humanity if we don't do it ourselves. But if a country like India does it, it will spread. It will spread. I think India already has had enough influence on the UN, peacekeeping force, as a force for reconciliation rather than fight. Our two neighbors are difficult. They keep drawing us into conflicts. But despite that, in uh, 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 BRICS and many other fora. Uh, imagine the Prime Minister being invited to <coughs> uh, Brazil for the BRICS meeting, to the US for discussions with the uh, President and by President Putin to open the next uh, uh, conference of uh, leaders. Uh, so I, I think uh, begin with Vishwas, but not with ego. Vishwas and Bhakti. Yeah, all right. Let me now uh, invite the panelists on the stage, Mr. T. S. Krishnamurti and Professor Chitra Mahadevan. Uh, I hand it over to Mr. Krishnamurti, and you should now hear more from the two of them. And I have spoken enough. You are the moderator. Uh, you may invite that, make comments or invite questions to the audience, and at the end you will give your remarks. So let's see the last one. Dr. Athriya, can I take the liberty yeah, of... The Thank you. Yeah, some of you may know, some may not know so well. I think some refreshing the memory, so that what kind of questions you can ask. Yeah. Thank you, David. I know you had a question to ask Dr. Athriya, but I think... Uh, no, we will. We he will give you time during. So be patient. So it's my honor, on behalf of Tatva Loka, to introduce the two distinguished panel member uh, panel members. One of them who is going to be chairing this discussion today, Shri Tharuvai Subhaya Krishnamurti. We all know him as TSK at Tattva Loka. Thank you so much for joining us. He is most famous for his role as the CEC, but he is also he is a former Indian Revenue Service officer, and he served in various capacities with the government of India including as the Secretary, Department of Company Affairs. 
He's also served as an IMF ambassador in Ethiopia and Georgia. As, an, as chief election commissioner, he was observer to the elections in Zimbabwe and the US presidential elections in 2004. In 2005, he was appointed by the Supreme Court of India to conduct the elections to the Board of Control for Cricket in India in order to ensure free and fair polls. Hi. Right. <laughs> right, so we'll give a hand. Well, one last word I would like to add that he, he left a lucrative job and career of the pre-nationalization of Bank of Baroda, Bank of India, Bank of India and TD Kansara was it, and then joined the civil service at a lower pay for the national service. So, I was most impressed when I read his 10th BG Deshmukh lecture last month. I have just noted down two points from your lecture no, for the benefit no, no, of the no, audience. You go to Chitraji, so we get the sure. Yeah. Sure. So, Dr. Chitra Madhavan is one of us. It is, it is my <clears throat> blessing to be associated with her. She is a acclaimed historian and the best art historian I know, an expert on, on everything about our culture. Thank you for joining us today, ma'am. Maybe just ask a question. How many would have read her article in Tatoloka? All of you were here. Okay, good, good. So I now request Sri TSK to conduct the session. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Atreya. <laughs> uh, good evening to all of you and uh, Special thanks to uh, Munja Atreya, who is uh, not only a friend and close relative of us, uh, he has distinguished himself in uh, the field of management and is a name to reckon with, particularly in the management circles. Today he has outlined uh, the Ram Rajya vision and value. I was uh, having a doubt, in fact, when I prepared my lecture for the Deshmukh Memorial Lecture, I had a doubt. Do we need good governance or do we need ethical governance or we need good governance or efficient governance? This is a big uh, dilemma going through my mind because while well, we have many Mahans who have outlined the need for ethical governance. The modern management experts have been stressing more on efficient governance, which is more important, which is more achievable. And uh, my own feeling is while ethical governance is certainly a desirable ideal, but uh, efficient governance is step one, which has to be achieved before we go on to the next move. In our country, unfortunately, the efficient governance has been in the back burner. And I blame the politicians and the civil servants, including myself, for the sorry state of affairs in this country. There are many things which we can learn from the West as far as efficient governance is concerned. But there are many things which the West can learn as far as ethical governance is concerned from India. Anyway, I think. Uh, Mr. Atreya, Dr. Atreya has outlined the bro broadly the ultimate goal. But in the present state of affairs, our um, political conditions, our economic conditions, and even social conditions do not seem to give that um, hope of achieving Ram Rajya. So let us first try to achieve ethical, uh, efficient governance and try to proceed towards ethical governance. With these preliminary words, I think I request. Uh, Dr. Chitra Madhavan to speak on the subject and maybe later I'll give some of my comments. Thank you, sir. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here once again in Tatwa Loka. I can only draw from history 
uh, from inscriptions to supplement what uh, Sir said just now. You know, most of our inscriptions have the names of kings, but uh, as a suffix, they will have Dharma Maharaja, Dharma Maharaja Di Raja, to say that they ruled according to Dharma. It was there for almost all the kings. The Pallavas had it, etc., etc. The inscriptions also tell us that these kings read the Dharma Shastras. It's very, very clear. You know, if you go into the Madras Museum, the Stone Sculpture Gallery, if you go to the first floor, there is a separate section for copper plate inscriptions. And there is one copper plate inscription of Rajendra Choda called the Tirvalangada copper plates. And it gives you so much of information about how Rajendra grew up, what kind of uh, Vedas he read, the Dharma Shastras he read. So all these kings were thoroughly trained in the Dharma Shastras for what? to rule according to dharma, very, very clearly. That's in all over India, but I'm quoting from a Chola copper plate inscription because this is our land and this is uh, Tamil Nadu. If you, this is at the level of the imperial uh, kings. If you go down to the village administration level, there also we have inscriptions that say that there were committees called sabhas. Every village had something called a sabha, which was an administrative organization of a village. And those sabhas were subdivided into variums, which were smaller uh, administrative units. You had an airy varium to take care of the, the lakes. You had a tota varium to take care of the gardens. You had so many other subcommittees. And to get onto those subcommittees, there was a selection system. I wouldn't call it an election system. There are very many inscriptions, including the famous Uttara Merur inscription, place called Uttara Merur, quite close to Kanchipuram. And they tell you that the people who had to serve on those committees, the big committees and the small committees, both of them had to be well versed in the Dharma Shastras. They had to know the Dharma Shastras. They had to be followers of Dharma. There are that listed that many do's and that many don'ts are amazing from uh, an inscription that belongs to the 10th century AD. And what's more important is that it was followed. It was not just in theory. So that kind of adherence to ethical and moral values was there. And that itself, I think, would translate into efficient administration automatically. Uh, one point I thought I should mention this. The monarchs in India, most of them particularly from the south and some of them from central India, like Jaipur and others, they were probably more cultured and more democratic than our modern politicians. So the question arises, do you want a, a democratic monarchy or monarchic democracy? Because today most of the politicians think that they are the rulers, but they are not, as you know. And um, unfortunately, the political class has somehow got itself alienated from the people. Whereas the monarchs have, as uh, Dr. Chitra Madhavan mentioned, they were much more closer to the people, they were closer to the Dharma Shastra, they were closer to the gurus that they had, and uh, they respected the views of the gurus, they implemented them. But um, considering the present state of affairs in the country and elsewhere, in fact, it's worse in African countries, which I have visited some of them for the elections. Uh, the future doesn't seem to be very bright, but that does not make us to be very uh, pessimistic. How do we cross this bridge, the implementation, as you mentioned, that how do we bring the, uh, bridge the gap between the precept and the practice? That's going to be the biggest challenge. And in a place like Tamil Nadu, I don't mind being bold in saying the concept of Ram Rajya may not sell. At least immediately, if not, uh, maybe later it may, but uh, immediately it will not. Maybe if you say Tirukural Rajya, then they may accept it, perhaps. But be that as it may, what I want to emphasize is that good governance has been probably more, um, has been given more priority in the monarchical um, rule than in the modern democratic rule. So this is where I think we have a biggest challenge and um, the civil servants who have been working for the political leaders have not been very, I mean there are brilliant exceptions like as he mentioned Mr. Session and others, there are many people including Mr. Deshmukh about whom mention was made, they all contributed but in spite of that I don't think uh, many civil servants really had the guts to take on the politicians. 
Well, I had an occasion when uh, I had to fight with the minister, which almost was every day we were fighting. And he happened to be from Tamil Nadu, unfortunately. And uh, the prime minister called me and said, um, your, prime, your minister has complained against you. I said, uh, uh, did you come to know of it only today or earlier? She said, yes, we have heard about it. And um, if you feel that I am uncomfortable for your alliance, you can take me out, you can transfer me. Otherwise, um, if you have any problem in finding a slot for me, I'll quit, I said. But he said, no, you will continue, the minister will go. The minister went, the government fell, and so many things happened. But the point I want to make a mention is, how many civil servants have the guts to differ from the ministers and take it up if necessary, even with the prime minister? So these are the things which uh, we need to stress. There are brilliant administrators in this country, there is no doubt about it. Every state has got some very honest and efficient administrators. But the point is, how many people have the guts to talk to the minister and say it is not possible? In fact, I told one of my, my the, the same minister, I told him that um, you have to give me, give me written orders and you let me warn you that if the matter goes to the court, you will be criticized and your leader will not protect you, I told him. And uh, these are the things which we need and we have a lot of literature in this country, um, ancient literature where uh, it has been told. In fact, uh, even a person like, uh, you know, who is that uh, talked about, um, who is an Astika, uh, I forget his name. Uh, uh, who, de who, de who, you know, who differed from Rama uh, when uh, uh, on the existence of God. Jabali, that's right, Jabali. So they had the guts to tell the people that you know, it is possible to differ and uh, the rulers appreciated them, it is not that they ignored them. Second point I want to mention is about communication. Unfortunately, uh, our politicians particularly are very bad in communications. They must learn something from Hanuman about the quality of communication because uh, you have to speak in such a way that you are able to not only convince others, but you are able to carry them with you. That is the hallmark of leadership. And um, there are many instances in Ramayana where um, Hanuman is supposed to have uh, communicated so effectively and so uh, uh, admirably. So these are some of the areas where I think uh, the experts, uh, management experts can do more research. Instead of quoting Rama perhaps, at least for the time being, we can mention how we had excellent administrators in this country, in ancient India, and how the rulers respected their, their advice. Even Shivaji is supposed to have had his um, uh, council of ministers whom used to give so much of importance. So it is uh, possible, provided we take slow steps. I have said in my BG Deshmukh Memorial Lecture, I, one of the points I made was, at the moment, what we have today is something that which needs surgical treatment as far as good governance is concerned. You cannot take incremental steps any longer because people are impatient. You've seen what happened in Hong Kong or any other country. So if you really want to achieve a noble um, state of affairs and if you really want India to be a superpower, not militarily, superpower democratically, I think some urgent steps are required to bring about changes. If the democracy in India is to be effective. Mr. Session, you mentioned about it. Within the law, within the constitution, within the framework of law and the constitution, you could bring about changes. That is the greatness of Mr. Session because many people couldn't do that earlier and the politicians really got scared that they are in for trouble. So this is uh, uh, within the democratic framework, within the excellent constitution that we have, within the law that we have, it is possible to bring about changes, at least to bring about efficient governance and then later on as ethical governance. So what we need to do is probably some kind of a research to see that um, the, uh, the journey from uh, the present state of affairs to improved governance, how it can be done. The roadmap has to be laid and maybe people like uh, Chitra Madhavan will be able to give us some ideas on the basis of the experiences we had with some of the wonderful leaders in this country. In fact, uh, people say that um, uh, Edgy Wells in the, one of his articles says about Ashoka. Though there are different opinions, the present economic advisor to the government of India thinks that Ashoka was not great. But whatever it is, the point that he makes, Edgy Wells says, is that amidst tens and thousands of monarchs that crowd the columns of history, the name of Ashoka shines and shines almost like a star. So we have many such brilliant people who have provided opportunities for good governance. 
And what is necessary in this state is that some urgent steps are necessary. Otherwise, I think we are, in, we are going into some kind of a chaotic situation. And I do only hope that we do not have people's power against the government power. Thank you. May I like to? May I make some comments? Yes. I think some important uh, data has been given, very valuable, by Dr. Chitra Mahadevan, and questions raised by Mr. Krishnamurthy. Uh, first issue he raised is about the need for efficiency. Th that is very true. Governments have to implement things faster. I think in that context, we may say that uh, uh, the implementation of Swachh Bharat campaign in such a big city like this, with a very dedicated secretary, like uh, Parameshwaran, uh, has gone relatively better than many other things. <laughs> but in management literature, this issue has been discussed. What is more important, an efficient government or an effective government? Hitler was extraordinarily efficient. Stalin was. Mao was. So it can be efficient with... Uh, uh, Indira Gandhi was superbly efficient in putting people into jail. So you may sacrifice a little bit of efficiency in order to have the effective government. That is where I think efficiency discounted by values becomes your uh, sustainable, effective governance is one. The, the other point he mentioned is the need for research, which is very valid. Uh, I, I envisage three levels here. I think in the first round of Onward March of Ramarajya, we, I think, are talking about the original source of Ramarajya, which is Rama himself and writings about him. The next level should be... <coughs> The uh, research that people like the Chitraji will do, that historical examples of various Indian kings uh, practicing Ramaraja right down to the present day. She gave the example of Raja Raja Chola. Uh, and from that, we also can relate it to the UK experience that constitutional monarchy may be better than purely electoral uh, rule because Margaret Thatcher became something of a dictator. And now, the only amount of stability in Britain is the Queen, uh, above politics. And who has seen this Queen has seen five Prime Ministers in her regime. She is the link and continuity. Uh, therefore, we need to have the President of India, which Dr. Kalam did for some time, evolve, but then he has a five-year term. Uncertainty may not be extended. Uh, the Norwegian countries have the ideal combination that they have a constitutional monarchy and very little involvement in politics. And uh, so we can look at this model and how we can have a president for a longer term and not as an instrument of the ruling party. The third level of research is what you said, that going to contemporary last 100 years, 50 years, good examples of secretaries, people like Sridharan, the metro man who changed urban transportation, 